Welcome to another episode of the Solutions Podcast, everyone. This is Jim Pastramatis. And I'm Michael Rosmer. And today we're going to discuss a topic that Travis Kling has coined the trust revolution. So, what is the trust revolution? Uh, you guys, you know, whether you know it under that name or not, you're probably very familiar with the concept, which is we've just had a breakdown of trust increasingly over the last, I don't know, it's probably most obvious to me in the last decade, but really in the last few decades of institutions, mm -hmm. right? So lock, loss of trust in government, loss of trust in the media, loss of trust in universities, loss of trust in corporations, et cetera, right? I would argue the last seven years more than ever before. It's basically been highlighted ever since social media came around. So maybe that's a great place to start because what I would ask to start off with is what is the root cause of this? Well, first of all, there's all sorts of access. Okay, so let's let's start from the beginning. That, well, back in the day, people, where would people get their information from? Mainly from broadcast media. Broadcast media, newspapers, like things like this, yep. right? Radio. Would, would people usually fact check those things and like... They didn't have an ability to. Right. Yep. Well, so that was that. Yep. So that would eliminate, for the most part, lots of discourse about, well, is this trustworthy and so on, and yep. things like this. Nowadays, when the internet is around, especially social media, there's discourse after discourse yep. um, about this all the time. YouTube, Facebook, you name it, to where everybody posts their opinion, yep. like people come up with their own content and their own skepticism and so on, and they're pushing it out there, yep. and you know that uh, stimulates the whole thing. Yep. So um, I think that's that's been like one of the main should I call it, not, not the root cause, the catalyst uh, to that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a part of the truth. I think, I, I, so I spoke, I don't know if we actually published this video, but I mentioned back in the day that in my view, there was like these three crises that we're going through as a society. One is the collective crisis of sense making, which we've done an episode on. Another is the collective crisis of competence, which I think also ties into this. Uh, and the third is collective crisis of meaning, which is maybe not so relevant to this conversation. So I think that one is the sense-making part of it, at least, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, hey, listen, we live in an environment where, A, maybe we shouldn't have trusted so much back in the day, but we just weren't aware of it, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly you can go and look at Cold War propaganda, yeah. and you can see just how one-sided it was, how, like, you shouldn't have trusted it, right? And so there should have been a breakdown, but because of the broadcast medium, the fact that there was only one really source of truth or relatively few, and even those were kind of in the same line with each other, you generally got the same narrative. And on top of that, the fact that you had this uh, reinforcing effect that the people who were on TV were credible, then if some person in a town hall was telling you something different, you know, you didn't really trust them as much, right? Yeah. So that, that made sense. Also, the fact that, and excuse me for interrupting, but also the fact that travel was much more limited and sure. therefore people couldn't travel sure. and actually experience certain things for themselves. It's why people wouldn't even question whether the education and the books and everything that's delivered to them is actually as it should be. Sure, right? Sure, and, absolutely. Yeah, and... Um, I, I mean, I would go so far as not even just to say travel, but the travel of information. For example, you didn't see how horrific things were in World War I on the front lines, mm -hmm. right? So they could have this big propaganda campaign at home saying like, you need to go to war. And people were like, oh yeah, I'm going to war, I'm standing up for my country, all this. And really it was horrific, right? Yeah. It was terrible. And you know, probably one of the most senseless wars in history. And you know, yet there was millions of people and you know, whole nations that were mobilized to fight this war and all for what, really, right? Mm -hmm. so, so they weren't even aware of that. And it's kind of like, you got the echo of it when they came back. But you know, maybe you could say, well, we won. So if you were on the winning side, maybe you could see some benefit. You know, in Russia, they were on the losing side and you know, they had the revolution afterwards. So maybe you can kind of look at it from that standpoint. Obviously, that catalyzed World War II in the German side, which also was a losing one. So there's some interesting, interesting concepts there. That's one side for sure. Yeah. The next side I think is interesting is this collective crisis of confidence, right? Which is, hey, listen, is there a breakdown? Because people are just not competent, right? And so the question is, okay, I, I think there's a pretty widely held view that people in these positions aren't competent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, whether it's you know, economists who are you know, supposedly well-renowned, 
or whether it's politicians or whether it's again media or influencers and things like this and i think that's a very uh not discussed conversation how the internet and social media has given the stage of um, well being able to have influence and a big audience to basically anyone yep. and that's been fantastic but at the same time like you see guys and girls that are like totally irrelevant doing some stupid shit and getting publicity and getting an actual audience yep. and then voicing yep. whatever nonsense yep. like you have okay whatever I, let, let me not even go let me not even go there and talk about specifically one person that i had in mind but you have criminals and left and right that they're making memes out of right because they might look funny they might this sure. they might that and they become popular and then suddenly like they have a platform to where they have access to millions of people yeah. and they're pushing out content and yeah. actually getting some fanatics to listen to them and you know yep uh and uh act on their um yeah and there's a reinforcement word. from the economics because you know people like sensationalism and then you drive clicks and you know a bunch of this sort of thing so that's another part of the issue I'm going to kind of like speak faster than I would because we want to try and compress this compared to our three hour episodes. I think there's a few interesting things to examine below that that I'll set as contact text and then we can discuss them. One is, well, what is the root cause behind this? And the first question is, all right, is there genuinely a lack of competence or is that just, you know, a misnomer? Mm -hmm. Number two, if there is a lack of competence, is it that there aren't competent people or that the competent people simply aren't brought up into the right seats, right? So, hey, listen, the competent people are sitting on the sidelines and the incompetent ones happen to get into those seats that are the seats of authority or visibility. Uh, and number three would be, okay, you know, mm. do we just genuinely have uh, a problem with competence? And if I think about the general problem with competence, is that, uh, wh why is that? And this comes to kind of a common narrative that I've been talking about for a while now, which is I believe the twin problems of our world are principally that we have an explosion of complexity and an explosion of scalar effects. And the complex these kind of interrelate with each other, but it's much more difficult to have competence in a highly complex world where there's these high scale effects, mm -hmm. right? So. Those would be kind of the, the initial tapestry that I would set. So maybe we'll start with the first of those and say, you know, do we genuinely have a crisis of competence or is there, you know, a uh, maelstrom of differing views that are difficult to sort from each other, which gives the impression of a lack of competence, but in actual fact, there is competence. Hmm. And where does that happen, you think? You think that takes place in social media and like people are... Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, let's take a simple look at uh, medical and government, right? Okay. So, you can really easily argue, hey, listen, Dr. Fauci, is he competent or not? Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's lots of reasons that you can argue that actually Dr. Fauci is very competent, mm -hmm. right? Pl plenty of reasons to argue that. You might say something similar for various high-level economists, et cetera. You might say, hey, these are like actually really smart, competent people. Uh, who are in these positions of power, but when you've got, you know, these uh, keyboard warrior type people who are, you know, self-proclaimed experts because they read a few articles and they were swayed and they don't really understand the deep nuances of it, that they could make that person look like they're not competent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we saw this leak, of, or it wasn't a leak, it was a, a release of Dr. Fauci's emails and it was interesting to look at some of the narratives around this because some people were jumping all over it as like this horrible thing. Yeah, yeah. And then some other people were like, hey, listen, you know, it was like pretty much he was a guy under pressure. And, you know, so you could paint that many different ways depending on the narrative that you wanted to sell. Mm -hmm. And it was in the best interest of certain people to paint Dr. Fauci as, you know, like malicious in some cases, right? And in other cases to paint him as, uh, you know, benign and somebody who was doing his best under a really tough circumstance and, you know, really had a lot of pressure on them and so on and so forth. So that's, I think, a nice microcosm for looking at, okay, is that person genuinely not competent? Or is it just we've painted them in a way and we've kind of kind of brewed distrust through this social media, like, it's not even just, like, it's almost like when you have a lot of voices, lot, you're gonna have lots of people who disagree, and invariably when a lot of people disagree, everyone's gonna look like they're wrong in the eyes of somebody else. Mm -hmm. So hence, you just have this broad 
sense of, hey, listen, these people aren't competent, even if they might be. So what would you say? Yeah, no, I, I know. And, and I've been thinking about this quite a lot. And I've, I've, been, I've been noticing how much has been taking place in, uh, in the world today. But, hmm, thinking of solutions, like how could you, I mean, this is just the internet being out of control as it is. I mean, right? I mean, people, people have the ability to do that. So what do you do? You take that ability away? No, no. I mean, I think clearly you can't just take that ability away. I think one of the things that's really, I've been thinking about it lately from the perspective of consensus algorithms. So in cryptocurrency, we have the need for the blockchain to agree on what happened. And so you have these algorithms to figure that out. And the thing that's really interesting to me, there's uh, uh, the cryptocurrency avalanche has this avalanche uh, consensus algorithm. And basically, you get this spread of information where based on kind of like your nearest peers, you adopt their views. And then those groups kind of join together and they get another view. And so you can have this, it's a little bit like a game of Go for anyone who's familiar with that, where, or one of these other games where basically like the colors of the board, there was a game called One-Eyed Jacks for anyone who's played that. And you would put your pieces down and it would change the colors of a bunch of the pieces based on how you played. And it's almost like that, right? Where, hey, listen, these people are swayed by this environment and then that environment goes into this other one and then it gets swayed accordingly based on which one is stronger, right? But the problem in these algorithms, these algorithms kind of come to a common point of like consensus, right? And they do that through sort of a tyranny of the majority. Now, if we look at that compared to real life, in real life, it doesn't happen like that. You get kind of a critical mass of groupthink that isn't swayed because there's a majority on some other side, mm -hmm. right? And that's probably healthy. It's probably you know, not good that you get consensus in a lot of these cases. But I think it's an interesting abstract for trying to understand, okay, are there some ways that we can build uh, mechanisms into this thing that help to... Into social media? Yeah, into social media that help to channel down to uh, more accurate views, right? Hmm. So if you say, hey, listen, you can have all these views out there, but there's some mechanism, maybe algorithmically or something like that, that gradually feeds up to a greater truth. Right? Mm -hmm. And a good example of this, I think, is Google search algorithms. If you look at Google search algorithms, one of the things that I think is a problem in a lot of this is you have algorithms that reward what's new as opposed to what's kind of credible long term. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about in Google search, you don't see what's new typically. You see what's withstood the test of time. Right? So Wikipedia comes up as a result because it's had so many links driven to it and so much credibility built over time yeah. that it gets a greater weight than some of these other things. Similarly, you can look at, in research papers, the number of citations is considered valuable, right? So you might have a paper that comes out that at first it's controversial, but over a long period of time, more and more citations add up until you get to the point where you're like, hey, listen, this is a really credible paper, right? Mm -hmm. But then you're opening up this rabbit hole of fact-checking and whether or not well, basically, what is credible, what is not credible. I, and then, you know, if we're going to come to, like, whatever, we use some algorithm that has to come to some consensus. Well, Facebook has tried to do that to some degree and to, like, filter out certain types of posts to their credibility and so on so they can have a certain view or a certain thing put out there. And people are very much against that. I, I think that the problem, though, is that you haven't addressed the... so. This is a challenging thing in general, right? So let's not pretend that it's uh, simple. But I think the problem is that Facebook is newsfeed driven. So it's always new. And trying to, you don't fact check something based on what's new very well, right? Mm -hmm. Let's use masks in uh, early 2020 as an example, right? So early statements were, hey, listen, masks are not effective. Mm -hmm. Later statements became masks are effective. You know, what happened? Well, I mean, aside from other things, uh, we gathered more data over time, right? As you get more data, you should have a better ability to make decisions and figure out, hey, what's accurate versus what's not accurate. And so if you're prioritizing what's new, you're inherently prioritizing what's inaccurate. Mm -hmm. It's just the way that it goes. Like, so basically, we should make it a principle that people shouldn't go and get their news from a place that's just like pushing out whatever is new for the day, but rather, I don't know, a place that is known for certified... Uh, research on a specific topic or, or yeah, I mean, sort. I don't think it necessarily has to be certified research, but I think that it's 
you know, I, I tend to think of this idea of like lies spread fast, but the truth has endurance, right? So things that end up being dumb don't stick around nearly as much. Now there's some prevalence, obviously, right? You still got flat earthers and things like that, but you have this thing that it's like, hey, over time, we tend to develop some understanding that snowballs, and you don't necessarily get that in the short run. So this is an example, just playing around with thought experiments of you know, one algorithmic change that it'd be like, hey, listen, I search for something. Do I get what's new? No, I get what has accumulated uh, some sort of credibility markers over time. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's lots of different ways that you can develop credibility markers, and I think, you know, Google's PageRank has actually some pretty interesting examples of that. For example, number of uh, links, okay, is one factor, but also the strength of those links, right? Is it a credible source that's pointing to you? And you can kind of gradually build credibility over time and go accordingly. So, you know, if you have, I don't know, pick somebody who has built a lot of credibility over time and has been seen to be credible in the community and they're endorsing something, well, that's gonna give more weight than if, you know, Joe whoever down the street does it, and Joe whoever down the street can lower their credibility by sharing crap, right? And so then as a result, well, when he shares something, it doesn't really count for as much, and you can algorithmically kind of figure that sort of thing out. When you say algorithmically though, what? Would we have some AI system that makes those decisions for us? Would Probably. it be like, go okay, so, so that- I, Similar to Google PageRank, right? Like, how does Google PageRank work? It's basically artificial intelligence, right? So. It's running some algorithm that figures out, hey, listen, what is it that the person is likely searching for? Mm -hmm. And so here you would say, you know, it would be an approximation. Of course, it's never going to be 100%, but it's going to narrow in on something that's more likely to be accurate, probabilistically. And it's probably going to, like, you know, it's not going to have just one result. It's going to have a bunch of results, right? So, you know, you can kind of see, but even those results, you know, like a good critique of some position, mm -hmm. hopefully is likely going to come up as opposed to a bad critique, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, does that fit into, you know, like the, the truth is the news feed has a lot of appeal and makes a lot of money for Facebook. Are you gonna yeah. get rid of a news oriented feed? Uh, probably not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a natural thing in human psychology that we care about what's new because there's this kind of like shock excitement. Novelty is appealing to us, mm -hmm. right? Probably because it appeals to some sort of survival instinct. So that being said, I think it's interesting to play around with this idea, of even like sources, right? And I don't think necessarily sources should be uh, manually rated, right? But there's probably some sort of indicators that you can have figure out, hey, listen, what sources tend to be relatively credible? Mm -hmm. You know, and oh, they tend to, so they tend to curate good content. All right, let's prioritize them versus ones that don't. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking if there was a system that algorithmically was tracking all those things and figuring out, okay, I'll come up with the good reviews instead of the bad reviews because, you know, majority of them are good or not bad and things like this. I wonder if a piece of the population would always feel like their opinion is invalidated because it's not so, because it's the minority. And I mean, it could be that they're the accurate ones. Sure. So it's like, how do you, like, is there like, if there was a system like this, where would the checks and balances be? I think that the whole point of it... Because clearly right now, if we're going to count on people to be the fact checkers, we're running into the problem of, well, you know, like, are they really fact checkers? Who's checking the fact checkers and, and all those things? Yeah, yeah. So if you rely on a system who doesn't have any political aspirations or any whatever biases of any sort, well, who checks that? Sure, sure. And I don't think that you want to have manual review, right? I think you want it to be kind of like organically crowdsourced if that makes sense. Um, can you elaborate? So, in other words, uh, rather than having some formal system where some self-appointed or appointed by any particular body fact checkers, kind of like what Facebook does right now, I don't think that's a particularly great idea, right? It's like, okay, great, these people are hired from you know, the New York Times or whatever, and you know, they have their biases. I think it's more like the uh, crowdsourced opinions is kind of like, again, it's kind of like a voting engine, right? You've got and one of the interesting things about voting engines, this is an interesting uh, experiment that was done, is they did some studies on the accuracy of experts versus groups. Mm. As I recall, they were uh, measuring what was the weight of a cow, right? So they would show a picture of a cow and they would say, how heavy is it? And you would have, I think it was like 2,000 people vote on what they thought the weight of the cow was, right? 
these people were just lay people. Then they had some experts say what they thought the weight of the cow was. And of course, most of the people were way off, mm -hmm. right? What was interesting is that collectively, they were more accurate than any of the experts. Why is this? They were, this was the case because of the fact that these people, the fringes canceled each other out. So yeah, you had people who were shooting way high and you had people who were shooting way low. But these two canceled each other out, so they were basically nullified. And it kind of coalesced towards actually a really accurate number. Now, they found that when you have a group where they're talking to each other, then that gets distorted by the loudest voice tends to tilt it in one way or another. This being said, I think there's something to be said for uh, over time, groups like through their responses, uh, providing some sort of feedback on the credibility of something and gradually being swayed one way or another, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens from that is that as they get swayed, certain people get recognized as experts. Mm -hmm. Well now, when those people put stuff out, those people's information becomes more credible or if they endorse something, that counts for more weight than somebody else. And you can kind of do that organically with modern systems. You don't necessarily have to do it with something, some sort of manual review, like the AI can kind of figure that out on its own. And then I think the whole point would be, if you're saying, hey, listen, because the danger of this, of course, is heterodox ideas get pushed down, new ideas don't get um, vi given visibility. It's like, okay, well, what would the task be of somebody who wants to have visibility for their idea? Well, they should build their credibility as an expert, right? And as they build that credibility, then they have the ability to put out these other ideas. And there can actually be a pretty clear path to doing that, right? It's mm -hmm. like, hey, listen, put out credible content, you know, endorse things that are factual, et cetera. Basically, it's almost like building a credit score. And who determines that credibility again? It's machine driven, right? Like it's, is this technology that would need to come up and, or, or is this like an evolution of all these technologies that like, avalanche and like all these companies are coming up with i mean i'm sure you would have to like you'd have some sort of an algorithm and it would have some kind of machine learning element to it that probably wouldn't actually be understandable by humans mm -hmm. right it's just the idea that i'm not persuaded that a machine can't do a better job of figuring out what is accurate or what is has a higher probability of being accurate than manual fact checkers i think that if you crowdsource it and you basically say hey let's take this whole collective of millions of people data and kind of their perception on it, and we allow that to filter out outliers, and then kind of like naturally coalesce on some kind of rating, and it's basically like a probability rating of like what's the likelihood that this is accurate, right? The other thing that would be interesting to add into that is kind of the idea of the semantic web, which is that data could be machine learn or machine readable, right? Mm -hmm. So if a machine is able to understand what it is that this content says, right? and then can sort of fact check it based on, you know, kind of a, a knowledge base or a knowledge web and get some sort of idea. You're like, okay, well that can have like another, it can be another variable in this algorithm for how to rank. Mm -hmm. I know Facebook has some technology like that, but I don't know if it's very advanced like this. Yeah, I mean, like this is something we have to look at in terms of progress. That being said, so I, I think to me, when I think about it, I think there's some competence there. Like I, I think there's a degree to which we have this breakdown in trust in part because of, you know, the, the madness of crowds basically going nuts and sharing all sorts of ideas and attacking people and things like this. That being said, I don't think that's principally the problem here. I don't okay. think that the main problem is, hey, listen, we have really competent people, but we're labeling them as being highly incompetent. Mm -hmm. um, so that brings us to kind of the next thing, which is, okay, is it that there are competent people, but those competent people aren't being the ones who are ending up sitting in the, the seats for the smart people. Okay. Thoughts so on that? The smart people being the politicians and people of power and influence? Yeah, people of, I would say people of influence just in general, right? So let's, yeah. it, that could be politicians, that could be people in the media, that could be people in the news, that could be uh, people running corporations, that could be uh, professors, that could be, you know, all these different things, mm -hmm. right? I, I think there's a different conversation to be had about um, the bureaucratic positions and, you know, like politicians and so on than CEOs of companies and influencers and things like this. You think so? Um, I, I think so. I okay. think so. Give me your uh, argument. And, well, I mean, as I was saying before, I think social media and the internet has given quite an equal opportunity to people to come up in whatever... Um, 
whatever system it is, right? And like gain a following and use that mm -hmm. following to where relevant people are gaining a following. Sure. So, I mean, so, if- So let, let me ask you, do you think that the quality of people in these institutional positions is higher than these irrelevant people? Some of them, for sure. I mean, when I say irrelevant, man, I don't, I don't yeah, know. I mean, if you, sure. Like yeah. Kylie Jenner is not a credible person on health or something like that. Right? So I mean, and and I think we we discussed this in another episode on how there's not enough incentive for some of these institutional positions for people to pursue. To where this is why I'm saying I think it's a little different. And and besides that, becoming the president of the United States or getting a chair at like whatever, like up there. Um, goes through all sorts of different processes than becoming an influencer on YouTube sure. or doing something like that, sure. which is why I'm saying it's so different. Um, so that's... Uh, I, I think it's difficult to argue that the level... Like, I guess I have an inherent distrust for institutions and the people running institutions. I think they're highly dysfunctional. I think it's... What in government institutions? All of them. Okay. Big corporations, don't trust them. Media, don't trust them. Uh, Academic institutions, trust them a little bit more, you know, not amazing, but uh, probably like the highest degree of trust would be for academic institutions. Yeah. Government, don't trust them. You know, pretty much across the board, I think it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. And I would attribute that to partially, uh, not just that you have incentive structures that don't attract the right people, but that the skill sets required to climb the ladders of power mm -hmm. are not the skill sets that uh, breed the competence in the field. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you can go and you can look, let's look at Jim Cramer on Mad Money, okay? I don't think Jim Cramer is a very great person to listen to for investment advice. I think he's mostly pretty not competent. I think that I know a lot of people in the financial realm who are far more competent than he is from the perspective of investing, from the perspective of financial markets, from the perspective of all that stuff. So why is it that Jim Cramer is the guy who you see on TV rather than a good friend of mine who probably has a far better investing track record? Like, okay. what's I the mean, deal there? Couldn't it be also that the one person put a lot more effort in business and exposing themselves to the right circles and the other person didn't? This is my point. So I think that the behaviors that make you competent at the field aren't the same behaviors that elevate you in the public absolutely. eye. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I we think, can definitely agree there. Yeah, and so I think that's part of the problem, right? It's kind of like playing the politics game in work is more likely to get you a promotion than being good at your job, mm -hmm. even though really it should be this thing over here that is the case. Yeah. Uh, being a good product guy and a good engineer isn't necessarily what's going to get you to be the CEO. Being a good business guy or a good marketer might be mm -hmm. the thing that will make you a good a CEO. And so I think we have a messed up, uh, it, it's like, it's kind of an incentive structure, but it's more like, you know, the skill sets that are rewarded are not necessarily the skill sets that are valuable. Mm -hmm. That's true. With that said, we have a problem with incentives if somebody wants to become a politician. I don't understand what the problem is in the incentive structure of doing the work and actually becoming, you know, that person that people listen to since mostly everybody has the access to do it. So I mean, maybe not to get on TV because you need to be exposed to certain circles, but I mean, we have access to YouTube, all of us. I mean, you're a fantastic example, bro. Fantastic example. No, like you're a competent guy. You could be a competent guy in your realm and do nothing, or you could be a competent guy that starts your, uh, your own channel like True. you have and yep. become a public figure. Sure. And yep. that's like by your own choice and competence. Why is not your friend doing this? Sure, sure. And yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair question. I mean, part of it is just, you know, preference, right? The person who likes doing science doesn't necessarily like being on TV, right? Okay. Just kind of think about it from that standpoint, right? So then maybe they should work under an organization that has that credibility on TV. Maybe. Otherwise, if you don't want to do this, should, should there be like a source where you do everything anonymously? Or, or what? I, I, and no, how but, could that, but that's not what I mean, right? I think that that person doesn't necessarily want to time their, spend their time dealing with public and dealing with these types of things, right? If I'm like an amazing chemist, right? What do I want to spend my time doing? Chemistry, yeah. right? I don't necessarily want to spend it on all these things, even though those things are where we elevate expertise. I understand. But then how do we give 
how do we give the spotlight to the people that are actually good at what they're doing and not good at just getting the exposure? It's a great question. If they don't want to get the exposure in the first place. It's a great question. What do you yeah. think? Well, look, well, that, that's that's what I. If it's not an incentive problem and they simply don't want to do it, okay, you can work under an organi organization that does all this work for you. Otherwise, what do you do? Yeah, and I mean, then you end up with potentially interpretation problems, especially in a complex world, right? So a good example of this is, I remember reading, I think it's Forbes writers, the average person is like 27 years old or something. Like, wow. yeah, so you have these articles written about business from somebody who's a journalist who's never done business in their life, mm -hmm. has no real experience. You know, you might say, hey, well, they're interviewing somebody who's some, you know, high-powered CEO. It's like, yeah, but the reality is that CEO has an incentive to paint a certain picture that's kind of like seems warm and fuzzy mm -hmm. as opposed to telling the hard shit, right? We've talked about a bit about some of these things. Like, you know, a simple example is, hey, listen, the truth is we talk a lot about the idea of honesty and the importance of that, but the reality is that everybody lies and actually learning, learning to do bad things at the right time is actually a pretty important skill and competency. And yet nobody wants to talk about that, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't make them look good. So you have this misaligned uh, representation where somebody comes out and says the PC thing because that looks good on TV, but it's bullshit. It's not really what's going on. Yeah. So, well, what about the other thing that we were just talking about just now? How do you get the people that don't want access to whatever, uh, they don't want the exposure, but they're good at what they're doing. They deserve the spotlight, but they're not working to get the spotlight. They're just working at being good at what they do. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you fix that? Well, I mean, it's a very good question. So maybe the issue is, uh, you know, I mean, perhaps there's something that has to be done at a, like a cultural grassroots level. So I think this is a really interesting question in general, right? To um, aspire to be a leader in your profession, to whereas now you yeah, just aspire I, to be good and I, that's I, it. I would say more like a sense of duty and obligation, right? I feel like this is a little bit missing from society today. That's, I don't hear a, a big sense that people have this like, hey, listen, I have a responsibility based on where I am to behave in a certain way and to do something for society. We see this with people with money, right? Like, I basically have the view that if you have a lot of money, you have an obligation to do the things that people who don't have money aren't able to do, right? So you get a lot of people who they'll say, oh, you know, well, I have a lot of money, and but, you know, I want to just do what I want to do. And so, and it's kind of like, fuck what you want to do. Like, you have an obligation because you're given these resources. And if you're not going to do that, give the resources to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But that's not really how it works. So you have this gross accumulation of wealth on the behalf of people who basically are going to live simple lives. And they're kind of societally rewarded for it, right? You see yeah. people who it's like, oh, he's got $100 million and he still drives the same truck 12 years later. And it's like, this is a waste. Yeah. Like, do not praise this. This person should be taking that money and going and, and doing something And fucking buying a Ferrari or something, right? Well, I mean, whether it's a Ferrari or whether it's, you know, funding type, some type of research yeah, or makes, doing something that, again, other people can't do, right? The wealth is wasted on the rich. You were exactly. saying that before. Yes, exactly. I, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So similarly, you have a lot of people. And I mean, look, there's some great examples. And it doesn't, the truth is it probably doesn't need to be all of them, right? Uh, a good example of this, I follow a, uh, she's like an astrophysicist on YouTube. Great stuff, you know, and so she puts out these videos on astrophysics, and it's super cool that you get somebody who's an expert in the field who's talking about that subject. You know who's very good at this? Um, I'm forgetting his last name, but it's Dr. Rahim or something like this. He is an amazing chiropractor, yep. amazing chiropractor, yep. and he puts many of his sessions on YouTube, and there's like over a million subscribers. Nice. And like he explains everything on the session, what he's looking at, what everything. Awesome. Where, to where you and I could understand everything that he does like his his thought process what he's going through how he uses his tools everything yep and that's i think a, another great example yeah uh, like this fantastic example actually yeah and so i guess not everybody in the space needs to do that and then the other thing that can happen like with this astrophysicist lady there was something to do with uh dark energy that was a recent kind of uh, data set that came out and so i was watching her kind of break down on the information and she happened to contact one of the like the head of one of the studies that was done and do like a video interview with her to get like some feedback on what that person had to say. Mm -hmm. So it kind of brought somebody who didn't normally build a YouTube following or whatever into the fold of being able to speak about it with a peer. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was quite interesting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there a few examples of this. So yeah, you get so I think to some extent we're moving in the right direction in terms of disseminating information. I don't know that we're moving the in the right direction in terms of having those people in a decision-making capacity. Yeah. And 
that's maybe a little bit more concerning because uh, those people end up, like maybe the right people who should be making a lot of these decisions aren't the ones who are making the decisions. And to me, you have a little bit of a, a screening problem in that case, right? Because somebody has to decide who gets promoted. And unfortunately, the people who are getting promoted to making these decisions are not the people who probably should be. Mm -hmm. Now, partially, there's maybe a duty obligation. Like I remember I had this for quite a while where uh, I would get elect, people would like nominate me to be the leader of the class or whatever, right? And I was like, no, no, I don't, I don't want this position, right? And so to some extent, there's like, hey, listen, step up. Like you have an obligation to go and do this. Another side of it though, is just, uh, you kind of need some no man in the room sometimes. The person is gonna be like, no, this person can't go there. You know, it's like, we need, to, we need to have some sort of a process that changes the filtering mechanism and filter self-selects for, uh, for competence. And it's interesting, like, how do you do that? Hmm. Again, you're talking about mechanisms and things like this. Most of these things like don't exist in the modern world even today. Um, I mean, th like they must exist somewhere, right? Like, if you think about, uh, you know, it, like if I look as a simple example, the quality of document that comes out of writing a master's level thesis is generally going to exceed the quality of a blog. Okay. Right. Yes. And why is that? Well, that's because you subjected that piece of paper, uh, that document, to a different process to get there, right? Fair enough. And so maybe there needs to be something uh, like that that is involved in this selection, where it's like there's some process they have to go through to demonstrate competence, and that demonstration of competence naturally filters for the people who are going to be better decision makers. I think I think it's an incentive problem as well. I Probably. mean, what is the incentive of, of writing a good master thesis? I mean, you have to do it to finish. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. But but also like to go through your interview and like whatever and yeah. like have a graduation that you're you're happy about. Whereas ultimately to get a job at the other end and absolutely. Yeah. But anyways, like you're doing all this at the end of the day, you want to be happy with yourself as well. Whereas doing a blog. What is the incentive there? I want to push out some content so I can get some traffic. Yeah, depending on the person. I mean, so yeah. the the incentive isn't the same. True. Though, naturally now after everything that's been going on in the world, people are looking after credible sources. So maybe there's going to be some counterbalance to this, to where you know what? Like I'm I'm looking at a lot of people at least on social media, and, and you see this in like all sorts of pages that are posting whatever news yep. and people are just unfollowing, basically saying, look, if you're going to be posting shit like this, like I'm just going to unfollow and hopefully over time that can, that can balance, people will just be looking for credible sources and, you know, not, hopefully. uh, hopefully. Yeah. 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 I mean, so from one of the things that I'm often, I often think about as a parallel is Socratic discussion. I think we might have discussed this in a previous, uh, previous video, but the whole concept of Socratic discussion, again, is like you go through a process, right? And I think that a lot of people try and focus on the object as opposed to the process that led to the object, right? So a simple example of this is you can sit there and you can say, hey, listen, in a business, you know, you'll blame the person who's doing a bad job, right? But really what you should be focused on is, hang on, like what in the process is breaking down that's hmm. resulting in that bad performance, right? Maybe it's a breakdown in the hiring process. Maybe it's a breakdown in you know, the firing process because the person's not getting fired. But realistically, you should have some process by which through training, through having the right documentation, through having the right tools and systems and clearly articulating what needs to be done and you know, selecting the right people and onboarding them properly and you know, how they work with others and how there's quality assurance and all this kind of thing, that that should lead to a predictably high quality result. Mm -hmm. And I don't see an emphasis on that amongst many people. Like most people aren't process oriented thinkers. There isn't a big focus on that in like, if you look at government, right? You can say, hey, listen, let's use an example of some sort of corruption, right? So in uh, Canada, there was like the We Charity scandal, right? That happened recently and the prime minister was, you know, complicit in it and you know people were getting a bunch of money that they shouldn't have anyway and what is the deal they're like hey listen we should fire these people and you know these people should be brought to justice and all this now nothing happened really and that's terrible but more than that 
the focus should have been, hey, listen, what's the breakdown in the process that resulted in the ability of this to happen? Let's focus on the process. Let's look at how Toyota was so successful with the Toyota production system, right? Very process-oriented thinking. Yeah. And so there's probably some mechanisms we can drive into the process of choosing and promoting decision makers that can help to refine who it is that gets in there. Mm -hmm. Maybe it goes back to the nomination, like, you know, maybe as a general rule, the person who's trying for it shouldn't be the person who gets it, you know? You should have more of a grassroots, like, hey, listen, let's go and seek out competence as opposed to mm. having the person, you know, kind of raise their hand. There's kind of this idea that the person who wants to be the leader shouldn't be the leader, right? The person should kind of be almost a reluctant leader, uh, which we saw kind of like the George Washington, right, as a good example. So you, you can, there's a lot of different models you can think of in that way, I think, for, for elevating uh, the right people. And equally, probably equally, is, hey, listen, how do you get rid of them when the wrong person is there. Mm -hmm. Because I think, especially in a lot of these institutions, they're very calcified. Right? Yes, that's very true. And so you've got governmental leaders. I mean, look at Biden as a good example of this, right? So Biden has been a politician for like his entire career, right? Like 40 plus years or something like that. And what has this guy really accomplished in his career? Arguably, he's not very competent, right? Like that was one of the, I think, best arguments against him was like, hey, he's been around for 40 some years. If he was gonna do something, we would have seen it by now, yeah. you know? What's he done? We haven't seen the evidence of it. So why is he being brought up here? Mm -hmm. Well, you need an ability to get those people out of the system, right? You're like, hey, listen, you're not adding value. Get out yeah. and get fresh blood in. If you're in a situation where you have, you know, we can run a lot of micro experiments and the ones that pay off, you retain. And the ones that don't pay off, you get rid of really quickly. You can kind of gradually build to a pretty decent organization. This is why, you know, you can hire 30 people. You can run a test with them. The ones who do badly, you get rid of. The other ones you keep, you know, you elevate those ones, you work with them long term, and it turns out to be something pretty good. Sounds very practical, but in a especially in the bureaucratic uh, government bodies over there, there's like, I mean, you would have to change the law, basically. Probably. But I mean, look, we're not just talking about government. Like, the reality is you get the same thing in business. Like, businesses are hyper dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. It is ridiculous how dysfunctional businesses are. And you say, well, hang on, here you have this market system, you have these economic incentives, surely the shareholders should be demanding some sort of better performance, et cetera, and yet you've got the president of GE earning $21.6 million in a year, and GE just being a total stagnant disaster of a company, mm -hmm. right? Like, how does that happen? Well, for, for how long until that company goes down or not preferred anymore? Well, the problem is they're all doing it, right? You have this, uh, like incestuous pool of, like I look at a good example of this is the telecommunication companies, the cell phone companies in Canada. Mm -hmm. And basically you just have this oligopoly that is non-competitive. They basically just all sit there stagnantly and screw the Canadian people because there's no pressure to improve. Yeah. And so, you know, if you think of the automotive industry, there wasn't really that much pressure to improve until Tesla came along, Yeah. right? Okay, you had Toyota for a while, but Toyota kind of stagnated after maybe around the Prius, right? And so it's like, okay, if there's no pressure to improve, you can kind of just sit and rent seek. And it's way easier for everybody to sit there and collect their checks than it is for them to push. It's really hard work to improve and go to the next level. It's like this constant, uh, constant battle. And, you know, so what's going on there? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of technology companies that, that were big and mighty, like Skype and all these, uh, you know, software companies. And then, you know, they didn't improve and other better companies came around and people just started switching. And so, I mean, that's just, that's just what happens. Yeah, but... Might, might not be instant. And maybe that's what you're arguing, that it should be a lot faster. Yeah, yeah, but, basically. Yeah. yeah but, and like, it could take decades in some cases. Like, look at the uh, whole rocket industry before Elon Musk came with SpaceX, right? Basically, you had since, what, the like 60s, 70s, you'd had Lockheed Martin and Boeing, who kind of jointly worked for the government. They were using 70s technology when Elon came along, yeah. 40 years old. Right? Where was all the iteration? Where was all the invention? It's not like they weren't throwing billions of dollars at this industry. Mm -hmm. Like, what are we talking about here? This is ridiculous. Well, this is, but, but could it be that, okay, the Skypes of the world were around, maybe because that was the best option around and no other companies really, you know, had, I mean, you, you can't argue that there wasn't any incentive. There certainly is incentive. Sure. There probably just wasn't enough, um, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the word is like you, you needed to evolve obviously to like 
to be better and that wasn't there yeah I, I mean i look at it and i think maybe part of the problem is there's no skin in the game on par the part of these high level participants and what i mean by that is they have no downside so if you think about that ceo of ge he has all upside there's no downside if the company stays stagnant what does it cost him zero zero he's going to get his 21.6 million dollars you know maybe his bonuses are a little bit smaller but he doesn't have anything taken from him mm -hmm. right if it was like there was a demand for growth and now we get into a whole problem of you know whether there should be a continual demand for growth but let's just assume that there was right and you didn't meet that and that hurt you personally right well now all of a sudden you'd have two things one is the rent seekers wouldn't be incentivized to come there because instead of rent seeking they'd be losing right there'd be a net loss and on top of that they'd be in a situation where they would be out pretty quickly, right? So maybe there's something where, and I think there is a lot to be said for this, that these people don't bear the downside. Look at the 2008 financial crisis. No, I mean, you have, you have zero good, people went have, to prison uh, over this. You definitely have a good point. That Look, the, the person that's responsible for the evolution of Skype or the company, if you're not doing a good enough job, you should get out and let someone actually do the job so we don't have to wait for other better, more but competent companies come and like, you know, have it, the market naturally I, shift up. I think the point is though, it shouldn't just be that they get out because they do, you know, some of them, like Ford went through like three or four CEOs leading up to Alan Malawi in whatever it was, 2006. Um, and, you know, so like they were getting rid of people. That wasn't the problem. The problem was, those people who they who came in and didn't do anything or didn't do a well, good job were not qualified enough well they didn't have any downside like if you became the ceo of ford you signed some contract for however many millions of dollars and if you did a bad job okay you lost the job and you kept millions of dollars yeah, yeah you're right as opposed to like hey listen you're gonna lose millions of dollars now this is painful now you're like whoa you know what like am i willing to put my flesh on the line yeah that's the difference with elon musk right like elon musk put his own money in that if he lost out, he lost his fortune. Makes sense. No, you're, you're, I think that's a fantastic point that you brought up. It's a different, different incentive. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think that he's awesome and I think that he brings up some amazing points. Good job, brother. I think, I think that was a great point. Well, that's, uh, you know, maybe. What can I say? I think that's a reason enough for you to hit the subscribe button. Make sure to hit the notification bell and, you know, the all notifications. Leave a comment down below. Let us know what you think. Um, well, share it with your friends on social media and, uh, you know, help us uh, stimulate the discourse. And Definitely listen to everything he's saying right now. Very important part of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I'll just go to kind of the last thing, which is I do think in spite of all of that, that there is a problem with an underlying explosion of complexity and scale that results in a natural degradation of competence. That it's just harder to be competent in today's world than it was in the world of 200 years ago. 200 years ago, it was just simple. Right? You're like, okay, great. We have to go and do some farming. Okay, we maybe have like four crop rotations and you know, like very basic technology. We certainly don't have GMOs that we have to worry about. We certainly don't have advanced fertilizer. We don't have you know, all these different complexities. That's just farming, right? Then you go and you start looking at something like medicine, right? Like, I mean, they didn't really have medicine back in the day. Try being a doctor today, right? Just think about like all the possible diseases somebody could have all the possible pieces of equipment, the things that we have to consider in terms of diet, in terms of stress, in terms of like on and on and on. This is a really, really complex thing. Yeah. Now try managing a medical system, mm -hmm. right? Now try saying, hey, listen, I'm the president and I need to manage the medical system, the legal system, the law enforcement, the defense, the, you know, on and on and on. Like, it's just outrageously complex. And in that environment, you're inevitably going to have people make a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then you've got things where it seemed like a really good idea on a small scale. And when you scaled it up, you discovered a little of a good thing, something that is good on a small scale isn't necessarily good on a large scale. And so you have this whole other set of problems, right? You're like, wow, this worked when we tested it in one town. When we put it out to the whole country, wow, not so good, right? Mm -hmm. So these are underlying challenges that I feel like our systems aren't set up to deal with. And we somehow as a society need to wrestle with the problems of how do we deal with an increasing degree of complexity and an increasing degree of scale? Because what we're doing now just doesn't work, right? You just cannot expect decisions to be made that are highly competent about extremely complex things. You know, 
hopefully, you know, once in a while, maybe you get like some massive genius. You get kind of the Elon Musk of their field, right? And they do an amazing job. But it seems to me that building a system that's reliant on coming up with a new supply of Elon Musk's, even though that, you know, is one way I mean, to try and approach Neuralink it. Neuralink is, is going to do something about this, I think. To Possibly. Something. Possibly, yeah. That's that's one potential way that it would be would be addressed. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if there's other ways that, again, I you know one of the, I think kind of the lazy way is to try and use artificial intelligence and more machine learning to do it, which is might I think probably likely to produce better outcomes. However, I think that producing those outcomes comes at the cost of making you highly dependent on this technology that is sort of a black box to you, and you know, then you're in a different set of problems, right? Yeah. So, I mean, when you're when you're talking about how to make your your systems more efficient so they run faster in every single department, could you do it without AI? I guess you could, but like you said, we're living in a much more complex world. Whereas embracing AI could probably help um, solve that. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe one of the things to do as well is to try and build for simplicity. You know, it's like there's a lot of things that you think about, you know, a supply chain, right? And stripping it down. I think Apple's a great example of this, right? Apple is a company that basically dealt with a lot of things by trying to just streamline them down. I can think about this with respect to laws, right? So I deal with, you know, residency laws and things like this. And I look at the way that a bunch of countries have it. And they're like, well, residency is a question of fact. This is the most bullshit thing in the world, right? Because at the end of the day, somebody's gonna have to make some decision, and it's completely unjust that the person who is being affected by this law can't know which side of the law they're on unless mm -hmm. they go to court. Mm -hmm. It creates a burden to some, like, uh, like the legal, it burdens the legal system because of the fact that you have to actually go to court to figure out the answer to this, even though the court's really like, how are they supposed to know this, right? There's, they're like, well, we're gonna kind of weigh out the facts, and we're gonna, you know, it's this nebulous thing going in, and then they're just gonna come up to a decision. So. How do you design for simplicity? Well, UK has done a great job of this, right? UK basically has like a flow chart where they're like, hey, if this, then go here. If not, go here. Based on that, if this, go here. If not, go here. And so they have this architected thing that works really well at providing a lot of clarity with relative ease while dealing with a fairly large number of variables. And you know, so I think that's an example of where we probably need to think in our modern world of like, okay, how do we build a streamlined decision-making framework that helps us to know which way we're going pretty reliably, pretty easily? Mm -hmm. I think, bro, we're gonna have to cut it short because mainly my concern is that we're gonna run out of battery. <laughs> All right, sounds good. <laughs> well, tell us what you think. Uh, I think it's you know an important issue that's pressing our world today. And yeah, we'd love to hear from you guys. Make sure you subscribe. Absolutely. Make sure you subscribe, hit the like button, tell this guy how awesome he did in this episode because uh, he did.